Hello again. Time for another update from Prophecy in the News. It's Friday, the 6th of April, and I'm going to answer a couple of viewer questions today. Uh, we get lots of email questions about Ezekiel 38 and 39, as you can imagine, because in our opinion, they represent a major war in the Middle East, which we believe to be just ahead. And that major war involves nations that are in the news today. Russia, Persia, that is Iran, uh, Togar the house of Togarma, which would be Turkey, and, and uh, some of the ethnic peoples all the way over to Macedonia and up into Eastern Europe and, and the, uh, the Western extent of Russia. Now, all of these nations are gathered together in battle against Israel in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And therefore, there's a lot of interest in this particular prophecy. Uh, we have a couple of letters, one from Andrew H. and the other one from Kurt M. And I'm going to read Andrew's question first. Uh, and, and he begins with a question, what is the basis for identifying Gog and Magog with Russia? That is very easy to do, given the perception that they are our enemies, but I have found no reason to link them together. In other words, uh, in Andrew's opinion, uh, Gog and Magog uh, should be linked elsewhere, uh, not with Russia, per se. They do not have any, anything or any person called Gog or Magog, and they were never called such by other people. Well, that's true, Andrew. Reading on, on the other hand, the city of London proudly claims two demonic mythological giants, Gog and Magog, as protectors of the city. Uh, if you bother to read the myth behind it, it is very old, older than the New Testament. You will see a very satanic claim as to the origin. And so uh, we have here Andrew suggesting that perhaps the UK, as head of the of some some sort of Western alliance, might represent Gog and Magog. But I have to to come back and and uh, explain that from my perspective, Gog and Magog are a spiritual or mystical and metaphysical title for Russia for the following reason, because Ezekiel 38 verse 3 says, And say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now there, here Gog is mentioned uh, as an individual or perhaps a leader, and he is referred to as, in the King James, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Uh, it's been pointed out for literally centuries linguistically that Meshach and Tubal represent uh, two regions of Russia, Meshach uh, or Mosky, or as we call it Moscow today, would be uh, Western Russia. Tubal, uh, Tubalsky, Tubalsk, would be Eastern Russia. And, and so the span of Meshach and Tubal seems to, to geographically uh, indicate uh, the, the country of Russia. Now, by the way, if you, when you look at the, uh, <clears throat> at the opening words of Ezekiel 38, uh, in verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, prophesy against him. The fascinating thing about this is, that uh, ancient Jewish linguistic studies concerning Gog and Magog have stated that Gog is the word root that means roof or uh, something that overhangs something else, and Magog means extension. And they have suggested for uh, literally centuries in their commentaries that Gog, or Roof, would become a Magog, an extension. That is to say, a covering power which is ex uh, attempting to extend its covering power. And I have no reason to differ with that explanation of Gog and Magog. 
Uh, and of course, Ezekiel wrote this several centuries before Christ, and uh, there is no reason to believe that that information couldn't have been taken uh, into Europe and particularly into London uh, by people there who picked up the name Gog and Magog out of the ancient texts and adopted them for their own uh, private ritualistic use. So I still believe that uh, Gog and Magog are Russia. And Russia, by the way, uh, lies straight north of Israel. And we have there another indicator of the attacker because it's in Ezekiel 38, 15, it says, And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company, a mighty army. And when you really read this carefully, uh, you discover that uh, the uttermost north is being uh, commented upon here by Ezekiel. In other words, not just a little bit north of Israel, but the uttermost part of the north, which would indeed be Russia. Our second question regarding this prophecy comes from Kurt M., and Kurt talks about the battle itself. Now, if you read Ezekiel 38 and 39, uh, you see that the, this great battle of the northern invader takes place in three stages. Uh, and, and he uh, asks the question about the last stage of the battle concerning what the uh, Israelis are going to do with the, the weapons of the enemy after the war is over. As you know, they have to dispose of the uh, bodies and the weapons from the invader. And Kurt says it takes them seven years to accomplish this feat, uh, ruling out the possibility that the war takes place during the tribulation since Israel will be fleeing for her life during the second half of the tribulation. And by the way, Kurt, you're exactly right. Uh, Israel uh, will not be in a stable position in the second half of the tribulation. Israel will literally be fleeing to a hiding place, and no one knows where that is, for good reason. God hides Israel during the second half of the tribulation, which means that the prophecy given here must take place really during the period prior to the tribulation, if it's going to be seven years in length. And I'm reading, <clears throat> and they that dwell, and this is Ezekiel 39.9, and they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields, bucklers, bows, arrows, hand staves, and spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. And this is the disposal of the enemy's weapons after the armies have fallen on the land of Israel. Not only will they have a seven-month process of burying bodies that are strewn all over the land of Israel, according to this prophecy, they'll have a seven-year period of... Uh, disposing of those weapons. Now, Kurt's point is, if this disposal period is seven years, and if Israel is under siege in the last three and a half years of the tribulation, then the seven-year period must start about three and a half years before the tribulation itself begins, in order, in order to give them time to do what is described in Scripture by Ezekiel as a seven-year period event. And, and by the way, Kurt, I totally agree with you there. And, and his question, his concern, I suppose, is uh, how in the world can this be? Um, how can this, this war, this invasion, start prior to the tribulation period? Is it pre-tribulational? And I believe it to be. By the way, I'm not alone in this. There are a number of expositors, uh, good dispensational scholars, who now hold the view that the invasion of Israel will take place at least three and a half years prior to the tribulation period, and maybe a little longer than that, in order for this event to take place as mentioned in Scripture. So thanks for your questions, Kurt and Andrew. And others, we do read your emails. Keep them coming. Uh, whether you're showering us with roses or uh, heaping upon us onions, <laughs> we'll take it either way, and we love to hear from you. Gary Stearman, good to talk to you again, and keep looking up.